Hello everyone, my name is Mouse, and today I'm bringing you an analysis of my latest blast chamber. This is version A2 of my super simple blast chamber series. It's the same model that I discussed with Il Mango in his latest video. I'm going to take a slightly different approach, and I'm going to talk about each individual system in this build and how it functions. I'll start at the end. This is a vertical design, which means that all of the blocks that are broken are pushed in from above. And this is the shape that I ended up using. You'll notice that it's hollow. Uh, there's a 3x3 three three that's been cut out, except for on these top two layers. And the reason for that is the way that TNT works in the game. The game will draw a 16x16x16 16 by 16 by 16 hollow cube around the TNT. And then it will draw a line to each block on the surface from the center. Each of these lines is assigned a strength, which is default, and then it adds to that a random number that's generated. Um, every time this line passes through a block, its strength is decreased, and that continues until it reaches the surface. What I found was that if I remove these blocks that are nearest neighbors to the TNT, I reduce this shielding effect so that the lines or rays have more strength when they reach the surface of the blast radius. So while you may be sacrificing nine blocks here, you could be gaining up to, well, in this case, 20 blocks here, which is a net gain. Uh, once I figured out that I'm using this hollow design, I went to a mod by XCOM, which allows us to set that random number generation to any value we want. So in this case, I set it to zero. So each of those TNT rays has only the default strength. So this is the minimum and guaranteed number of blocks that will be broken by a TNT burst. This is approximately 190 blocks. I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, this is a shape that I didn't end up using because it's nearly impossible for this to ever happen in practice. The distribution is continuous from 0 to 1, and the chance that the game rolls a 0 on every single TNT ray is infinitesimal. So here's an example that uses 0 0.1 for the random number generation, or 10% of the maximum. And this is approximately 238 blocks. And I've marked out the differences between the true minimum and this shape in green. And on the other side, I've marked out the differences between our shape and this shape. You'll notice that these corners are not guaranteed blocks in this 10% model. Um, however, each of these corners has multiple rays passing through it. And the chances that each of those rays rolls a 0.1 in practice uh, is compounded. So the probability that this block doesn't break is 0.1 to the power of the number of rays that pass through it. From experimenting with this, I found that one of these blocks can be left behind after a TNT burst, roughly between every 100,000 and 1 million TNT blasts. Um, to put this into perspective, on a four game tick clock, you would need to run this farm for between 100 and 1,000 hours before you had a fraction of a percent chance of it breaking due to uh, like a push limit problem where these blocks stack up and then the piston on top can no longer push it. Once we've figured out what the shape is going to be, and I figure this shape is more than adequate for the lifetime of one of these blast chambers, we break up the logic into the different layers that we want to push in. Here I push in a total of 11 different layers. I start by pushing in these four sets of rows, each of these is a slice, then two 5 by 5s three hollow 5 by 6s 
a 5x6 that has the middle filled in. And then the last layer you push in has to be the full profile so that all of the blocks are block 36. Once I've figured out what layers I want to push in to build the shape, I have to actually code it into the blast chamber. And to do that, I need to separate out the different patterns we'll push down. I achieve this using observers and redstone dust on top of slabs. And what we need to be able to do is push down the diamond blocks independently, the gold blocks independently, iron independently, and sea lanterns independently. And I achieve this. Here, the trigger will send a signal through to this redstone line here. And then this line is connected to all of these systems here, but disconnected due to an opaque block. These opaque blocks are then moved with the logic. This is just simple cauldron and signal strength logic. I use signal strength zero four times for these four layers at the bottom. I then have two signal strength ones for the five by fives, three signal strength twos for the five by sixes that are hollow. And then we have a signal strength three for the five by six that's filled in. And finally, we have an opaque block, which takes a reading from this dropper. And that will open up all of these different redstone lines and allow the entire top to be pushed down. Moving on, this top set of observers and redstone dust will only take a signal from this trigger. And the way that works is once the top layer has been completely filled in, this redstone block will be the last block to move forward, which will unpower this redstone dust. This will send a zero tick signal on retraction that will power this repeater, among other things, and that powers all of the redstone up here that triggers the pushdown. The way that blocks are introduced to the system is you would have a block stream coming in from the side, which reaches this smart piston, and that will push in this layer. This layer will hit a super speed button which will push down and reset all in the same game tick. Once the blocks have been pushed down, they go into what I'm calling piston delay. This is necessary so that when we go to explode the TNT, we have enough time to run out its 80 game tick fuse after the last row necessary to complete the chamber has been pushed in. As the blocks are coming in, when this first row fills up, it can be cycled through the system at two different speeds. The first speed is the default quick speed, where it's cycled through the piston delay rapidly. This is timed so that on a four game tick clock, it can handle when it is only pushing in a total of two blocks out of the seven. This corresponds to times when we're pushing down this 5x5 five five region, and there are times when you're only pushing in two blocks as you're filling in this layer. The other redstone timing is the long redstone timing. It's activated by this redstone line, which moves the opaque block from the right to the left and powers this line. This has 11 redstone ticks between the different piston delays and gives a total of 66 game ticks of delay from the initial row. This is necessary for the fuse time of the TNT. So this line is activated only when we're on the final opaque block of the signal strength logic. And all of this corresponds to having just pushed in this layer. This layer is key to this because once this is pushed down, we know that we will only be pushing in full rows, which have the maximum possible delay. And that's why we've chosen this 11 redstone ticks between the pistons. So if we have seven blocks coming in on a four game tick clock, that's 28 game ticks. 
And of those 28 game ticks, I only needed 22 of them. So this is 66 game ticks of delay. And then also, when we're on this final opaque block, this is activated. So instead of passing the trigger signal immediately up to this system to push down, it now passes through an additional delay, which makes up the final 14 game ticks you need in order to match the block 36 to the TNT explosion. In order to trigger the TNT, we count the total number of rows that have been triggered. This is done here using a dropper counter. There's a total of 45 rows before a TNT, and that's just found by counting the number of rows in our logic. When we reach 45 rows, the redstone block will move. This line will retract, which will send an insta signal. This signal then powers the TNT dispenser and its launcher. The way this works is that the TNT is dispensed into an opaque block, and then it's sitting on top of a slime block, which launches it upwards. I'd like to point out that you can get two different sets of heights. So if we take a look at our log TNT, here it is dispensed inside an ice block. And we see we're getting 44.02. If we change the block it's sitting inside of to a slime block, we get 45.08. The final piece after the TNT has detonated is transitioning back from the long delay to the short piston delay. What you'll find will happen when you do this is that this system of input will jam. This occurs because on the long delay, it takes a while for the blocks to transition all the way through. And when you swap to the short delay, the next block that is pushed in actually runs in to the blocks that are still cycling. In order to get around this, what we have to do is we need to cycle all of the blocks that are still in here out rapidly before we make the transition. To do that, there's a order in which you need to cycle these. Top second, and then top and third, and then second, and then the top again. That system can be found here. After the final transition, this observer is retracted again, powers this block, and then this is just a simple logic that will power the pistons in the correct order. One final note. This chamber can only handle a four game tick or slower block stream. I hope that everybody has found this educational. Remember to stay tuned because Mango and I are very excited to bring you an even simpler version of this, as well as a secret 500 block per TNT blast chamber. As always, I'm happy to answer any questions. Leave me a comment or send me a message.